I'm Gary Dick, and welcome to this inaugural edition of The New Crossroads, as we uh, explore the power and the possibilities of the Internet of Things. We're coming to you from Indianapolis, the crossroads uh, of America, but increasingly uh, the crossroads of uh, the IoT space. And I'm pleased to begin our podcast uh, this month by introducing my co-hosts, uh, Judy uh, Okenfuss and Stephen Reynolds, both with the law firm of Ice Miller. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, great knowledge and, uh, and insights uh, into the space. Judy is the managing partner of the firm, also is chair of the Internet of Things industry group. Before becoming a lawyer, she was an engineer developing products for military aircraft. So Judy, thanks for being here. Stephen, of course, an attorney, a former software developer, and an IT uh, analyst, also chair, uh, co-chair of the firm's data security and privacy uh, group. He learned to code in middle school, right? <laughs> yep. and, and developed uh, web-based software while going to uh, law school. So I'm going to rely on, on you guys for some great insights and in questioning here. Uh, of our very special guest, our first guest, and no one more appropriate as that uh, first guest than John McDonald, the CEO of uh, Clear Object, based in Fishers near Indianapolis here. Uh, Clear Object is the fastest growing uh, IT company in Indiana, according to Inc. Magazine, fastest growing uh, IT company three years running. So congratulations mm -hmm. for that. Thank you very much. And John, you're so uh, involved and engaged uh, in the technology movement here in Indiana, uh, with a, a particular focus in IoT. And I want to begin with the, the most basic of questions. We hear so much about IoT mm -hmm. and the Internet of Things. What is it? What is it? Yeah. Well, um, very simply stated, the entire purpose of the Internet up until very recently has been really the Internet of People. Uh, it was a, about creating devices, computers and mobile phones and the like that would allow us as humans to connect to the Internet. Uh, I have five senses, um, but my iPhone has 12, and most of which are used to augment me and the reality around me, you know, things like uh, magnetometers and temperature sensors and the like in order to make me a smarter endpoint to the Internet. Uh, a, a phone you know, that isn't connected to the Internet is pretty useless. and It doesn't even keep time very well, quite mm -hmm. honestly. So, but what uh, is happening is increasingly there's a, a movement to connect devices directly to the Internet um, without humans being involved in it and without being the interface between them. And that opens up a, a lot of new possibilities. Um, you know, First of all, we already talk about how things are have more sensitivity than humans. There's more sensors built into them. Things can go where people can't. Uh, bottom of the ocean, no human can be there, but at the very lowest point, there's a box of sensors. Uh, there are way more things than there are people. So 27 billion was the estimate that I read recently by IDC for the number of devices connected to the Internet in 2021. And things have more to say. Um, these, these windmills that we have on I-65 driving up to Chicago, um, they send 400 data points a second, each one of them. So what all that boils down to is an immense amount of data. And that's really what the Internet of Things is about, mm -hmm. is harnessing, capturing, and streaming all that data. And, and that's what makes the future so exciting. Good. So, and I've heard you talk a little bit about the Internet of Things, and when you do, You've broken it down into three main buckets sometimes when you're talking about how the Internet of Things is going, we're going to see it used in business. Yeah. Maybe we could talk a little bit about those. Yeah, so I like to say that, and actually others have said, my great friend Scott Fadness likes to say, the Internet of Things is good for companies that make things, move things, and grow things, um, or transportation, logistics, uh, manufacturing, and, um, and agriculture. Um, we're pretty good at all three of those in Indiana. Um, we're number one as far as the amount of our gross product that's in manufacturing. Uh, we're number one in the amount of goods and things moved through our state. We're number 10 overall in agriculture, which sounds not as good as number one, but if you think about who we're competing with, that's actually pretty good, <laughs> right? Little Indiana. Uh, and those happen to be the three industries that are changed most radically by I IoT right now. So there is this amazing intersection really the new crossroads of when you insert technology into these things get data from them why indiana should be better than average if not the best at this uh, based on what our historic um, value proposition has been um, well let me and i know you probably oh, have a good let me just follow up just on the logistics mm. and we talk about the internet of things and logistics what would be some of the likely benefits to business mm. 
when you use it? Well, there's sort of two things in logistics that you think about that are benefits. The first one, and really where a lot of companies are beginning, is in the servicing and support of customers, so sort of extensions of customer service. Right here in Indiana, we have a company called Cummins Engine, and they have a system called Connected Diagnostics that allows them to uh, interpret and understand fault codes that are coming from the engines, which were things that turn on the check engine light in your car. But they can happen uh, quite frequently when you drive a diesel engine up and down uh, mountains and into deserts and whatnot, and they're usually emissions related. Um, truck driver doesn't know what those things are. Uh, fleet operator sort of does, but Cummins really knows. And so what they're able to do is grab those messages and within one minute send a message to the fleet operator and let them know what it means. So what is that really? It's about providing a value enhancement to the product to their customers and that's one thing that's happening a ton in, in logistics. The other thing that's happening is the, the concept of the walls and size of my factory walls and what does that really mean. So if I'm building you know, automotive components in some factory in Ohio and I need a particular part because I use just-in-time inventory which is what most factories do. You know, the knowledge of the fact that some truck may be backed up on I-75 in some traffic accident is pretty important to the operation of my plan. It may keep me from bringing the workers in the first thing in the morning, saving a whole bunch of payroll, and that may be the distance between making a profit or a loss that month in my factory, particularly if I have a competitor that's doing it better than I am. So the knowledge of that supply chain and where it's at and how it feeds my, my own operation and where it goes from there is another way that IoT is really revolutionizing uh, you know, the whole idea of transportation logistics. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that, that's all fascinating to me. I, I think the logistics in, in particular, there's just so many pop, uh, possibilities and opportunities mm -hmm. there. One thing you, you mentioned is you talk about the shift in the internet. Uh, from connecting humans to the internet to devices to the internet. I guess what do you see as really the main efficiencies there when you're talking about that, that shift, which is really what the IoT is? Yeah, you know, the ob observation that has been made by others is that, you know, uh, Netflix, which is the largest broadcaster in the world, owns no television stations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Airbnb, which is the largest hotel company in the world, owns no hotels. Uh, Uber, who's the largest uh, car rental facility in the, in the world, owns no vehicles, right? And so what is it that they own? What they own is data. And what they do is they uh, deal in the data that's moving between you and the consumer and the availability and product and good and service that you want. Uh, that's what the new economy is built on. And so at the heart of IoT, as we've already talked about a couple times here today, is data. And what IoT really does at its heart is open up vast sums of additional flows of data beyond what we as a human can do on our own. And understanding and harnessing that and using that to infer from those data streams the needs for products and services and other sorts of support things are really what IoT is about and what it's driving all of the decisions that are being made to invest in it or not, depending on who you are and where you're at in the whole life cycle of that. You mentioned agriculture uh, and IoT, and certainly a lot of talk about uh, feeding the world. I think the world population is to reach something like nine billion mm. uh, uh, by 2050. Technology is going to be important. Indiana is increasingly, I think, becoming uh, that hub for technology and innovation. How does IoT really play into that whole mm. ag piece? Here, I'll give you two examples again. Uh, here in Indianapolis, we have this cool company called Tyner. Pond mm -hmm. Farm, which was uh, built up by uh, Chris Baggett, who is formerly of uh, Salesforce Marketing Cloud and before that Exact Target. And what they're doing is, I like to think of it as our own Omaha Steaks in Indiana. What they're doing is they've got a group of farmers that are producing various forms of livestock. They work with uh, some captive processors to sort of cut those things down into steaks and fillets and whatnot, freeze them, vacuum pack them, and then use and borrow the mechanism from Cluster Truck, which is their, their sister company, to, um, to deliver those to your home so you can place an order and the next day be able to have it on your doorstep. What they really want to do is be able to trace all the way back from the original piece of livestock all the way through the process what's happened to your food. Uh, sort of having integrity in that process as it goes. So that involves all kinds of technologies like RFID tagging and field, you know, tags on the ears and the field for that. 
even in the processing plan and making sure that that data integrity stays. So the whole idea of processing food and delivering it to you farm to table is really revolutionized mm -hmm. by the ability to track all these things and be able to understand the data that's coming from them and follow it along. Another company we really like uh, like is a company called Robot, R-O-W-B-O-T, so mm -hmm. it's a clever misspelling of robot. <laughs> and what, what they've done is they've developed a device that actually goes out between the rows of corn or soybeans and stops and samples the soil and then injects into the soil a particular compound of chemicals and water and other sorts of things to optimize that particular one yard of ground. Uh, it can zap weeds with air, so it use a lot less herbicides, and then move on to the next spot of ground and do it again and do it again and do it again. In fact, it could do it all night long. What they've learned is that, just like they tell you not to water your lawn in the heat of the day, they're actually learning that it might actually be better to farm in the dead of night, um, which actually makes some logical yeah. sense if you think about it. We've been farming in the broad daylight since, well, you know, the beginning of farming. <laughs> That's what we can see, right? Yeah. But if robots are doing it, we don't have to do it in the daytime. We can do it all night long. So the mm -hmm. farmer might be able to deploy fleets of these vehicles, maybe hundreds of them in this field at night, uh, and then wake up in the morning and see what happened. So. so one of the things I find fascinating with agriculture, and you also mentioned it when you are talking about the supply chain, is just the amounts of data. Mm -hmm and the use of the data analytics to help whether it's growing product, producing machines. I mean, you have, you can what, normal farm, you have the air temperature, the humidity, the moisture of the soil, the ambient light. Mm -hmm. You can use all of that to grow better products, Absolutely. to grow more products. Absolutely. So that, you know, as, as a lawyer, one of the things that I continue to think about and worry about is the ownership of the data yes, right. and who owns it and, and what's your thought as you start thinking about the ownership well, of the data? Well a story like I like to tell in public often is a story where you're driving down the road in your car and your car notices that you're not keeping your lane as effective as you did about an hour ago and it realizes that it's three in the morning and it thinks that you might be tired. It also knows that two exits up is a 24-hour Starbucks and you like double chai latte so on the car radio comes the message would you like a double chai latte? And if you say yes, it beams your payment information ahead, places the order, and then when you go through the drive-thru, you get your coffee and the car thus having saved its own life as well as yours. <laughs> now, I, one of the, our customers is a company that makes about half the car radios on the planet, and we manage all the software that goes in those for them. And so I can tell you with great confidence, the car radio that you probably have in your vehicle out in the parking lot can do what I just said. Except then you may ask yourself the question, hey, how come my car doesn't do that, right? I kind of like yeah. that idea. And the, the reason you, that it doesn't is because you don't want it to. Um, there's a few other people that you probably would not like to know are that you're weaving in your lane at 3 in the morning, right? Your, your, your spouse, your insurance company, the state police. Um, you also don't want your car spamming you as you drive up the road, right? Because it's not just you know Starbucks that wants that. Dunkin' Donuts wants that data. Hilton has a hotel room they didn't sell you the night before that they want to sell you. Who wants that? And so you shut it off and you don't want to do it because you can't control the stream of data that's right. coming from the devices that you're using. They're sort of betraying you live and you can't control it. And so you're not allowing for that because you don't have the ability to exert control over it. And so as a result, that data isn't available to people. It can't be used even in productive ways. And so what we need to continue to do as an industry on IoT is not just think about all the ways we can get data, but be thinking about the ways we can control that data and give that control to the source of the data so that they feel comfortable giving it up and free so that we can help them help themselves with what it is that the data is saying. It's a fascinating spot, and I can tell you it's the white-hot center right now of the whole IoT industry is thinking about those problems. It, it really does raise a lot of questions, including security. Yeah, I think it raises both security and, and privacy concerns. I think the example you gave is, is a great one. I think you, we're already seeing lawsuits in this area mm. where you know consumers are alleging that a product they purchased was collecting data about them and being transmitted to third parties without their knowledge. That's right. And so those are already starting to pop up, and I think it, it just you know brings back uh, you know, just in a different context, some of the convictions we already have in a privacy context, which I think is, you know, what is a user's expectations of the product? Do you expect your car to be transmitting this data and right. to who? Like, you, you may expect your car is transmitting certain data to the manufacturer, mm -hmm. uh, but you may not expect them to be sitting at the Starbucks. <laughs> yes, you know, that's, exactly. that sort of thing. And we have, you know, things we're developing technologically to help solve this. There's a technology called blockchain, which came from the um, Bitcoin, which is an alternative currency. 
and as I like to joke, maybe the only interesting thing that comes from Bitcoin. But what it is is, is a way to trace a Bitcoin from its inception through every transaction that happened along the way as it moves around. It's a publicly available and publicly auditable log, basically, of every movement. This could be really useful for IoT, right? The idea of being able to trace you know, a piece of data from its inception through every handling piece that it had along the way, again, could be a technology we could borrow and really use to be able to make sure that we have integrity for that data cycle all the way from the beginning. But you know, there's also the issue of perceived versus real security. Um, sometimes I like to joke or tell the story that you, you go to Amazon, you put your credit card number in, you feel a little queasy when you put the number <laughs> in. You think it's safe, you know it's safe, but, but you still feel that way. And then you leave and you go to a, you go to a restaurant and you order lunch and you hand the waiter yeah. your credit card, <laughs> right? And he walks away for yep. 10 minutes, right? And you never think anything of it, right? And so what's the difference? The difference is in that very moment, small moment, you created a bond of trust with the waiter. You can't create a bond of trust with a computer, at least not yet. And so if you have an errant charge on your credit card, the first thought you have is the waiter. He betrayed mm -hmm. me, right? right? And so that's a perceived versus real security, which is, but which is safer. By far, Amazon is yeah. safer, yeah. right? The real security issue is the waiter. The perceived security issue is Amazon, and yet they're completely flipped. And so we have to be able to separate those things into what's real versus what's perceived. Yeah, yeah so we were talking from agriculture going back to the industrial internet of things, because yeah. you know, going back to the move, build, and grow. Yeah. And we have the success stories like robot, mm -hmm. but then let's take it back to the more industrial and try and think yeah. of what are some of the success stories for established companies yeah, in using mm -hmm. IoT. You know, I have heard things about using the internet of things to make workers more safe. Mm -hmm. sure. Because you can monitor machines and how mm -hmm. machines are operating in real time, something that really can't do now. That's right. So what are some of your thoughts? Can, can the industries use that? Yeah, well, as applying IoT to industry really falls once again into two buckets. It's the idea of being able to uh, use it in the production line, sometimes called industrial IoT, uh, and then also embedding the technologies into the product that you're manufacturing. Um, so uh, sometimes that's said, you know, making products better or making better products, right? So uh, as an example, again, here in Indiana, we have a, a company uh, called Rolls-Royce, and they make uh, jet engines. And they pioneered a model called a Power by the Hour. And what Power by the Hour is, is uh, for instance, Delta Airlines doesn't own any jet engines. Instead, mm -hmm. what they do is they pay Rolls-Royce for Power by the Hour. And it's mm -hmm. Rolls-Royce's job to make sure that there's a working engine strapped on that plane before it go, pulls away from the gate. And if they have to put 14 different engines on it until they find the one that works, it's on Rolls-Royce, not on Delta. So this is good for Delta because it's an expense that they can manage to and plan around. It's great for Rolls-Royce because it's a recurring revenue stream, but it makes the data about the engines and how they perform become very important to Rolls-Royce, right? To be able to do predictive maintenance and quality issues and other sorts of things so they can keep their costs down and ultimately build a profit margin into it. So, and there's examples all over the place of how we've been doing production work using robotics and sensors for many years. In fact, some of the people that have been in that space are like, where have you been for the last half decade, right? We've been doing this for years, right? So a lot of it is very fine-tuned in the production process. It's truly the first place in the world where IoT took root, which is on the production facility. And uh, there's all kinds of companies all over Indiana uh, really all over the Midwest that really made their bones on being able to insert technology into the production process first and are now leveraging that into the product itself. Right. And I've heard about some companies who can actually, like Harley Davidson, which has taken mm -hmm. their whole production time mm -hmm. down yes. by using the Internet of Things right. and sensors and gone from a 21-day cycle mm -hmm. to six hours. So yes. you can customize and really meet customer and consumer expectations mm -hmm. for better custom products mm -hmm. faster. Yeah. Do you think that's the way we're going to see businesses yes, going? Yes, I definitely do. In this open ecosystem of suppliers, so many industrial products are basically fed by parts that are fed by parts that are fed by parts. Mm -hmm. And there's little innovations that happen all, all along the way. But once you roll up all those components into a finished product, you have all of these parts, right? All of which now are not just have to be integrated from this, the screw fit into the bolt, but also from a software perspective increasingly as the amount of software that's in these products has, sort of explodes. 
the only way to get that all to work together is by opening up that process in a secure way to include all those suppliers in so they can be bringing their innovations to the table and you can be removing inefficiencies from the process that you might have had before. All done by IoT, all done by sensors, all done by data. Awesome. Yeah, it's fascinating. I think I like the example of the uh, the engines too, because I think that gets in an area where I work with in my law practice, which is uh, the trade secret arena. Yes. Right? I frequently handle cases involving trade secret misappropriation, mm -hmm. and uh, when you think about you know the, the engine manufacturer collecting data on its customers, you think of you know what value that data has, and that that may be considered trade secret because it may tell you a lot of information about the airline. It may tell you how busy they are, how many flights they're doing to certain destinations, or and how long those flights are lasting. All information that would be valuable to, to their competitors or to investors. You know, they may be interested to know how busy that particular airline is. Have you seen companies really give thought to the, the trade secret context in this space? Yeah, in fact, I would tell you, it's an interesting point you bring up, I would tell you it's probably the number one inhibitor. We've been talking a lot about manufacturing, transportation, mm -hmm. logistics, agriculture, because they're the leaders in this, right? Well, if you start to look at the laggards in this, right, which are the industries that are not moving very quickly in this space? Well, it's medical industries, which makes some sense. It's, uh, it's banking, finance, and securities, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and governments, uh, all who either real or perceived believe that the data that they deal in requires extra handling care in the process, right? Again, some of that's real, some of that's perceived. And so that whole idea of exposure to the private medical information, to financial mm -hmm. transaction information, to government information, really slows those industries down in their ability to connect up their data and get comfortable with the amount of data that's flowing around. If you look at agriculture, transportation, logistics, manufacturing, what's another thing that's common about them? They're very open industries, right? They have parts of parts that are supplying. They have people that are moving things around, an interconnected web of logistics. You've got farmers that are getting seed producers and, and corn producers and manufacturing. It's a very, it's an intertangled web of suppliers and vendors, right? So they're already used to sharing information back and forth. Yeah. But in the industries where you have that lack of openness, you have that lack of advance. Final question for you, John. Uh, What's next? I mean, it just seems the rate of uh, innovation is uh, break speed. I mean, it's, it's continuing. The possibilities are limitless. What's going to be kind of that next wave we're going to see? Is it, is it, is it the data secu uh, security issues and other things like that that will slow things down? What, what, what's kind of that next thing to look at in the IoT space? I think that the most exciting thing is to me of the whole thing is autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that there are sort of five levels of this, and level four is a vehicle that can drive itself under most normal conditions unless there's some sort of road blockage or whatever where the vehicle will sit, fail safely, so sort of pull over and stop and wait for driver input. That's in the product roadmap of most of the major product manufacturers in tw the 2021 model year, which means you will mm. be driving That's autonomous vehicles. And when you do, everything changes. Now you can have autonomous delivery of packages in minutes mm. Uh, you have that, you don't need stores. Uh, we have so many roads because we have to, to keep separation and only drive so fast, but you know, now you can run a bumper to bumper, which means every car is a private train car and every road is a rail line. You don't need mass transit. <laughs> right. We can run them at 200 miles an hour, which means now you can get to Chicago for lunch, and that means we don't need short haul <laughs> airlines like Southwest Airlines. I mean, one little idea completely changes mm -hmm. the entire landscape, and that's yeah. just vehicles. So I think people don't really understand what's going to happen, and every company is really an IoT company. Some just don't know it yet. Yeah. John McDonald, thank you very yeah. much. Fascinating uh, perspective. Thank you. Not a fascinating uh, space, and we've uh, enjoyed having you on this initial edition of the new Crossroads. For my co-host, Judy o uh, Oakenfuss, yeah. also Stephen Reynolds from the law firm of Ice Miller, we thank you for joining us. This is just the start uh, of uh, really an exploration of the Internet of Things. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you next time.